So I am a, a vascular medicine specialist and a cardiologist and work closely with the team as the director of lymphatic medicine. Definitely not a surgeon, don't want me with a scalpel, so there are a few more words here. I have no disclosure. So we're going to talk about uh, causes of secondary lymphedema, the differential diagnosis of edema, and the approach to an edematous limb. This is a big topic. We're going to try to kind of uh, speed through it. So secondary lymphedema, quite simply, is the injury to the lymphatic vasculature with resultant lymphatic dysfunction. It's quite common, uh, much more uh, frequently seen than some of the other um, conditions we just heard about. It, it accounts for about 99% of all lymphedema cases is in what we all see um, most commonly day to day. Affects about one in a thousand individuals, and the mean age uh, is in the 50s in the U.S. Most common cause worldwide is something called filariasis, which I'll touch a little bit more uh, on in a moment. And in Western countries, it's breast cancer treatment uh, after lymphadenectomy and radiation therapy. So uh, quickly on filariasis, we don't see this in the U.S. It's, uh, it's a round worm that inhabits lymphatics and subcutaneous tissues that's transmitted through a mosquito. Again, it, fortunately, it's not here in the U.S., but depending on where you practice, you may see it the world is shrinking and there's a lot of immigration, uh, there, you're going to have patients that have lived in these areas uh, in blue, so uh, parts of South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, and the Pacific, a little bit in the Caribbean. It, there's 44 million cases worldwide as an estimate in uh, 2013. 33 million cases cause serious uh, disfigurement and incapacitation. One third of infected patients will have clinical manifestations. So there's a lot of patients that live in these areas that have filariasis but don't uh, demonstrate the the lymphatic dysfunction. There's an acute phase with adenolymphangitis, which is a fever, swelling, and discomfort of lymph nodes. And then there's the chronic phase, where you get infiltrations of the, the inguinal lymph nodes most commonly, but it can affect any lymph node bed. And there's rarely sufficient exposure. You need to have multiple insults uh, and exposure to the, the parasite. So rarely is it someone that traveled, oh, I, I took a trip to Indonesia for two weeks. That's probably not going to be enough. Uh, it's usually patients that have lived in that area and now have uh, immigrated to the U.S. Uh, you can test it uh, through a couple blood tests. It can be treated in terms of getting rid of the parasite itself, but the sequelae and the damage to the lymphatics are unfortunately uh, we're stuck with uh, for the time being. Uh, it's remarkable, uh, and uh, you know, Global Health has uh, done a remarkable job look at trying to eradicate this, and they've given over 6.5 billion uh, medication prophylaxis to try to, to rid the areas, but it's still uh, very common. So let's move on to what we see more commonly here in the U.S. and the Western world. That's cancer-related lymphedema. There's multiple mechanisms, direct trauma to the lymphatics from a lymphadenectomy, the removal of the lymph nodes or destruction of the, the lymphatic vessels, radiation-induced injury, which I'll touch on a little bit more here, and we have other speakers later in the symposium. There's a question of the role of chemotherapy-induced, and then there can also be just direct uh, effect on the lymphatics from the cancer itself, so lymphatic compression and lymphatic, and lymphatic infiltration. One of the most uh, serious cases of breast cancer-related lymphedema I've seen that was rapidly progressive was someone that had metastatic disease that infiltrated into the lymphatic system. There was really no way uh, to combat that. So looking at various cancers, the incidence of lymphedema by cancer, breast cancer, uh, the rate is about 30 percent. Um, it's the most common in the U.S. because breast cancer is the most common cancer uh, among women. Uh, you can see melanoma, 9 percent, much more common in those that have melanoma of the lower extremity compared to the upper extremity. Uh, gravity taking effect, uh, GU cancers, gynecologic, with the much higher rate among those that have cervical or vulvar cancer compared to uh, endometrial cancer. And then sarcomas, uh, you see the rate there, about 30% as well. Not surprisingly, the longer you are out from your surgery, the higher the prevalence of uh, lymphedema. We see it a day after surgery, uh, and sometimes it may not pop up for several years afterwards. So breast cancer-related lymphedema specifically, and the prevalence, depending on the study and the population you're looking at, ranges from 20 to 30 percent most commonly, but wide ranging from 5 to 50 percent as well. About 75 percent of patients will present within three years uh, of their initial treatment. So risk factors, there's multiple risk factors for breast cancer-related lymphedema development based on the treatment uh, you had. So axillary lymph node dissection increases your risk fourfold over sentinel lymph node dissection, increased number of lymph nodes removed, receiving adjunctive radiation therapy, mastectomy over wide local excision, lack of immediate breast reconstruction. So those that have an immediate breast reconstruction tend to have a decreased risk of lymphedema. Increased body weight, post-operative infection, post-operative seroma or hematoma, and there's a question of uh, the role of taxane-based chemotherapy as well. So to delve into a couple of these in a little more detail, and again, there's going to be further speakers that will discuss uh, some of these in, in further detail than I will, but a couple studies here. One looking at the breakdown uh, of a threshold of five, 
Lymph nodes removed, and you can see the rate when under 5 is about 4%, when greater than 5, about 18% in this one study. In another study, they used a threshold of 10, and you can see, again, below 10, you know, that 5 6% range uh, prevalence of development of lymphedema, where greater than or equal to 10 lymph nodes, you see a dramatic increase, you know, over 25%. Uh, in terms of uh, the role of radiation therapy, in those that just get a sentinel lymph node biopsy, it, it appears uh, in this meta-analysis that the addition of radiation didn't play a huge role in terms of worsening lymphedema. However, in those that had a full axillary lymph node dissection, when you add on radiation, that uh, the risk of lymphedema jumps up uh, significantly. Uh, this was a, a, a randomized controlled trial looking at the management of breast cancer, and then subsequently they looked at what is the development of lymphedema in these patients. Uh, some of the cohort got a sentinel lymph node biopsy plus radiation, and the other cohort got a sentinel lymph node biopsy and a subsequent axillary lymph node dissection if it was positive. And you can see, although radiation is certainly not good for the lymphatics, it may be better than doing a concomitant axillary lymph node dissection. So other causes, moving away a little bit from breast cancer-related lymphedema, uh, secondary causes include trauma, seen it after a fractured bone, blunt injury, a car accident with a lot of pelvic injury even without a fracture, uh, Non-oncologic surgery, including joint replacements, venous ablations, um, for varicose veins, and as was mentioned earlier by Dr. Padera, infection. So obviously, filariasis, which is a direct injury to the lymphatic with infiltration, and then we're learning more and more about the role of the inflammatory and, and maybe bacterial-specific uh, roles of, uh, in cellulitis and erysipelas. So interestingly, looking, this was a study at uh, our colleagues at MGH, looking at uh, a a surveillance cohort of patients that had breast cancer treatment, about 700 patients, and they looked at, they looked retrospectively in those that developed lymphedema, had they had cellulitis before? And you can see in those that have a history of cellulitis, the risk of developing lymphedema was about 15%, and those without a prior history of cellulitis, the risk was about 7%. So this plays an important role in the development of lymphedema, and it's kind of cyclic. It worsens lymphatic function, puts you at higher risk to have subsequent cellulitis, and it, it's this uh, horrible cycle that's sometimes difficult to get out of. Other secondary causes, chronic venous insufficiency, or a fancier term, phlebolymphedema, obesity-induced, and then lipolymphedema, which is lymphedema associated with uh, lipedema, which we'll touch on. Uh, so phlebolymphedema is the overwhelming of the lymphatic system, not really a dysfunctional lymphatic system. It just can't keep up with all the extra fluid and edema that's uh, occurring because of uh, venous either obstruction, compression, or uh, incompetence from the valves itself. And you can see the exam looks similar uh, to both, it's like a combination of venous disease and lymphatic disease. You can see uh, on the left you have ulcerations, but you also have fullness of the toes, which is more commonly seen in patients with uh, lymphatic dysfunction. And then on the right you have the hyperpigmentation co commonly seen with uh, venous disease, but again, down uh, towards the toes you see that significant edema consistent with lymphedema. This was a study back in the 90s done by colleagues of Dr. Ostergaard looking at patients that had what was thought to be chronic venous insufficiency, and they did lymphocytograms, and they said, what is the amount of uptake in the nodes in these patients that weren't otherwise diagnosed with lymphedema? And you could see those that had normal, uh, that didn't have chronic venous insufficiency, the controls, they had a normal amount of uptake in their inguinal lymph nodes. Those that had varicose veins, so relatively mild chronic venous insufficiency, had lower amount of uptake in their inguinal nodes, and the, the lowest rate of uptake in the inguinal nodes were those with ulcerated limbs, the most severe form of chronic venous insufficiency. So there is certainly uh, an interplay between the lymphatic and venous system. Moving quickly towards obesity, there's uh, a clear interplay as well between adipose tissue and lymphatic function. As early as the 1950s, it was understood that patients that were at a higher BMI around the time of breast cancer surgery were at higher risk for lymphedema. Uh, the odds ratio may be of uh, three or four three or fourfold, and those with a BMI greater than 30. And we've seen that weight loss is effective in reducing the size of the limb. Even in patients that don't have a second hit, that don't have, haven't received cancer treatment or subsequent uh, cellulitis, obesity in itself can cause lymphedema. And it's thought maybe it's around the BMI threshold of 50, 55, where this starts to occur. It's not fully understood why this happens, what the mechanism is driving this obesity-induced uh, lymphedema. Is it increased production of lymph from the enlarging limb? Is it external compression of the lymphatics by the adipose tissue? Is there direct injury because of weight and diet changes? Decreased lymphangiogenesis? Is the development of venous hypertension for those uh, with lower extremity uh, lymphedema? And again, it's this cycle. Lymphedema drives more adipose disposition that causes more inflammation, which worsens lymphatic dysfunction. Again, it's a cycle similar to cellulitis. 
So let's transition a little bit to the differential of chronic uh, lower extremity edema. Uh, as Drew mentioned, you know, in our clinic, about 25%, and it's growing uh, to even more, are coming in with, quote, unquote, lymphedema and do not actually have lymphedema. So what is, when you see a patient, you want to make sure they have lymphedema. Sometimes the treatment overlaps, but you want to make sure you're giving them the most uh, accurate diagnosis, or at least making sure you're understanding uh, the multifactorial nature of their edema. So in terms of the differential, uh, we'll go through this in a little bit more detail, um, but venous, uh, in terms of unilateral, venous and lymphatic are the highest on your differential. When it's bilateral, you have to really think outside the limb. Is there a systemic cause that may be driving this? For upper extremity, it's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, again, it tends to be either lymphedema or venous. And when it's venous, uh, rather, gravity is not as much playing a role with the upper extremity. So you really have to think, what is wrong with the venous system? Is there a compression? Is there a clot? Is there something else going on in the upper extremity? So when I see a patient that walks in the door with chronic lower extremity edema, uh, I never say they have lymphedema even if they come billed that way. They have edema until uh, otherwise documented. So if you have bilateral edema, do you have a systemic cause? Do you have heart failure, liver failure, renal failure, hypothyroidism, obesity? Is there a medication that may be uh, driving some of this, or is there a central venous obstruction? I then will undergo a serologic evaluation if I have a high concern for any of those. And then if it's unilateral or it doesn't seem likely they have one of the systemic causes, we go down the path, what is their risk factors for the development of lymphedema or other causes uh, of a more local process? So do they have a prior DVT? Have they had prior trauma or surgery to that limb or the limbs, recurrent infections, cancer treatment, filariasis exposure, or family history of limb swelling? I got to say the physical exam in this space is more important than maybe anything else I do. I see patients from a variety of different uh, clinical conditions in the physical exam is unfortunately dying, but maybe that's better because we have uh, better testing in terms of radiographic studies. But I think the physical exam is so important in these patients. I have a lot of fellows will see the patient first, and they come in and try to explain to me the exam, and I said, we just got to go see him. And that's the, that's the best way to help guide what's going on. From that, we can get some more objective data with imaging uh, from our radiology colleagues from low extra venous ultrasounds, nuclear lymphocytograms, lymphangiograms, MRI, MRV, and an echocardiogram in the appropriate patient. For upper extremity, a little bit more straightforward because the causes are um, less broad. For bilateral, really, unless they've had bilateral insults to the lymphatic function, it's a venous cause. You have to look at a central process. So do they have uh, a history of a central venous catheter, either for dialysis or a port for chemotherapy? Do they have a pacemaker? Do they have a thoracic malignancy or a mass that's pushing up against the veins, something called SVC syndrome? Or is it unilateral? Again, similar list of exposures as you see with the lower extremity. Physical exam is key, uh, and then uh, undergo the similar amount of imaging. So just to reiterate that point, this is uh, that Dr. Singal made earlier about a lot of people walking through the door do not have lymphedema. This is from a, a UK group, uh, a quote-unquote lymphedema clinic. And you can see that about 39% had secondary lymphedema, about 13% had primary lymphedema. And the remaining, so just about under half, had some other problem that was driving their edema. So we're all familiar with these pictures. We'll go through relatively quickly for time's sake. This is upper extremity lymphedema, the various stages. The differential, like I said, is relatively low. And a lot of patients will have a history of breast cancer when they walk through the door. But you want to make sure a lot will have, they were at higher risk for uh, DVT because they had malignancy in the past. A lot of them had had a catheter placed for chemotherapy or had other procedures. So what you want to make sure they don't have is superficial uh, veins of the chest wall. These are collaterals that develop, so if they have a central process that is stenosed, the body's smart enough to, to rework collaterals around that stenosis. So you can see this on the chest wall. That's not normal. This is a, probably doesn't project very well, but there is some formation of a light blue. Again, they look like varicose veins on the chest. That's not normal. And what you could do is look and do a venogram, and you can see this is a very tight stenosis in a patient that had venous thoracic outlet syndrome uh, in the subclavian vein in the chest but came in with swelling that otherwise could have been easily called lymphedema. Again, lower extremity, we know these pictures well. Let's go through the exam quickly. The Stemmer sign was described by Dr. Stemmer in the 1970s. Dr. Capozzi from France may have, may have also uh, described it in the 1880s, so it may be called the Capozzi Stemmer sign. But it's the inability to pinch the base of the second toe, and this can help differentiate lymphedema from other causes of edema. Uh, the way I tell my fellows, it's like you just can't grab it. You're, you can't grab the, the base of the second toe. Your fingers slide right over it. We see a lot of skin changes that are more specific for lymphedema than other causes of lower extremity edema. Uh, where there's a peau d'orange, it's a pitting, a dimpling of the skin, similar to the rind of an orange. You get more severe uh, changes with cobblestoning. Here, 
papillomatosis, and then some of the inf chronic inflammatory changes uh, that patients with more severe chronic lower extremity lymphedema have. To differentiate it slightly from those who have chronic venous insufficiency, here you see there's a, a range uh, from kind of simple varicose veins uh, to langectasias. This is something called corona phlegmatica, which is a uh, accumulation of veins in the medial malleolus uh, due to chronic venous hypertension. Lipodermatosclerosis, uh, which is a thickening and hemosiderin darkening deposit in the lower portion of the leg. And then in more severe cases, you get ulceration. It can look like an upside down champagne bottle. Uh, there is a retraction of the skin uh, in this lower uh, portion of the distal leg. This is not seen with uh, pure lymphedema, so it can help differentiate if you're not sure. And again, I showed you a picture of flebo lymphedema before. And then quickly, just to differentiate between lymphedema and lipedema, there's a lot of patients that will come in with, that are told they have lymphedema, they've been in compression for years, when they in fact have lipedema. And lipedema, in short, is the inappropriate accumulation, disproportionate amount of fat accumulation, most commonly in the lower extremity of the buttocks, thighs, and can even affect the lower legs. But you can see here, there's almost complete sparing of the feet. So they'll, rather than here, we have kind of that buffalo hump around uh, the forefoot with edema all the way up. You can push in, you can feel this edema, it's firm. This is relatively soft, kind of nodular fat. It can certainly be tender and is a big complaint of a lot of the patients. You have this ankle cuffing and, again, sparing of the feet. In more severe cases of lipedema, you can certainly develop lymphatic dysfunction and, and have uh, a pitting edema, and that's um, lipolympedema. So there's undoubtedly an overlap. I'm not a basic scientist, but I'm sure there's some mechanism that why a patient, there's thousands of patients that will have a venous ablation and not get lymphedema. So what is it about that one patient that they had a, a venous ablation and subsequently developed lymphedema. There was probably a genetic underpinning, some primary dysfunction, and they have a second hit that tips them over. I don't think we fully understand that yet. There's certainly an overlap for a lot of these uh, occurrences. So in summary, secondary lymphedema is much, much more common than primary lymphedema, though I think we can learn from the mechanisms of primary lymphedema to maybe understand better who's at risk for the development of secondary lymphedema and help guide our, uh, our treatments there. Consider even mild insults and precipitating lymphedema, and have an open mind in the initial evaluation. Just because they come to you with lymphedema doesn't mean they actually have lymphedema. It probably is most likely lymphedema, but it's not always, and it's often multifactorial, which can be the most difficult uh, patients to treat. Thank you very much.